is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Dark Lord of Dark Home by Diana Wynne Jones, brought to you by Patricia Bing Grant. In these chapters, so poor Dirk's kids, oh, they're doing their best. They really are the precious little cinnamon rolls, but this is so much more than they ever expected. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And yeah, this, uh, <laughs> this episode. Okay. So you know, what's really fun, um, is that this whole section of this book is about logistics. And those of you who listen to the, um, book club podcast know that I just covered the Martian, um, which is a real logistics heavy book. And I love that crap. I really do. And this, what this whole section deals with, you would think like after reading The Martian that I kind of would have gotten enough of this sort of thing, but it's uh, essentially figuring out how to plan this pilgrim party thing. Um, when you don't have the abilities or the resources available that you expected to have, which, okay, not exactly the same as being stranded alone on Mars and figuring out how to survive. Obviously they don't go into like the enormous amount of detail in, um, dark Lord of Dirk as they do in the Martian, but there's a similarity there that I found very comforting and familiar after just finishing the Martian when I sat down to read this. So, <laughs> This whole, this section is his, Dirk's kids, because Dirk, he is out of service. <laughs> um, he is unavailable and recovering from dragon fire, dragon hot smoke, because later on it's revealed that the dragon was so ill that he really couldn't produce proper fire. So he managed to survive the dragon's attack because the dragon just didn't have the wherewithal to really like give it to him. And his kids are all trying to cover up the fact that he's down for the count from Barnabas because even like Barnabas, first of all, they suspect that maybe he would tell Mr. Chesney, which is, one of those moments where I'm like, I, I don't really know what the worst to happen could be if he did tell Mr. Chesney. Um, if that, like, because there, there's so much that, about this world that I still don't really understand and so much about the repercussions of that that I don't understand that I'm really unsure of what what's at stake here. Like, if Barnabas told Mr. Chesney that Dirk got injured, would Dirk be penalized for not commit, like fulfilling his obligation, even though he eventually healed and was able to pick up where he left off? Would that still count against him, even if he was almost killed and it was not his fault? I mean, obviously, for me, that seems very unfair, but Mr. Chesney seems like a son of a bitch, so maybe that is exactly what he would do. Um... And, you know, they mention the fact that Barnabas just doesn't want to do it himself because nobody likes being the Dark Lord. And he's just afraid that if he doesn't come back, because they tell Barnabas, like, oh, he's gone away for a few days. Um, but he flips out so much that they realize that's really what it is. Um, I'm looking at, I'm trying to find the exact spot where he says... Um, Oh yeah, where's Dirk? The soldiers have arrived. When Kit answered that Dirk was away for a while, the change in Barnabas was startling. He went pale. He sagged with such dismay that even his curls seemed to droop. But he can't go away. He's Dark Lord. It's... 
it's irresponsible. Um, so what is it that she tries that they tell him is going on? Like, where do they tell him he went? Here it is. Um, I kept it simple. I told him there's a very old dragon just woken up after 300 years. All truth. Except I told him the old dragons up north and the younger dragons sent Dirk an urgent message for help and Dirk rushed off at once. After all, it's just what your father would do. And But have you said we're going to fill in for dad? Several times, Mara assured her. Barnabas was terrified he'd have to deal with the soldiers on his own. Now let me rush off and get into proper clothes before I freeze. They saw why Barnabas was so frightened when they arrived at the valley half an hour later, the humans on horseback and the griffins on the wing. There was an enormous crowd of men just beyond the ruins of the village. Each man was dressed in shiny black and armed with a shiny black helmet and a long sword in a shiny black scabbard. Most of them were simply standing. Some were wandering in circles. A few others were sitting on the ground, and there was something very wrong with all of them. Beauty, who was carrying Shauna, refused to go anywhere near. The other horses trembled and sweated. "'What's wrong with these people?' Colette asked. "'It's all right,' Barnabas said reassuringly. "'They send them through drugged.' "'Why?' said Colette. "'Ah, uh, well, you see, they're all convicted criminals, mostly for murder and assault and so on,' Barnabas explained. "'The Turs clear out the prisons once a year.' I believe Mr. Chesney has a contract with some of the governments in his world, and they pay him to take these convicts off their hands. It's a very neat arrangement. Most of them get killed over here, but they're all promised pardons and free land and so on. All we have to do at the moment is get them to the camp I've made for them a couple miles over there. What? Y'all... I don't... <laughs> All right. I know I've soapboxed on this, on on Spoil Me before. I'm going to do it real quick again. Y'all, I feel like Wynn Jones has something to say. And I'm going to bring this up again. But this bitch is talking about the prison system. And she is unhappy with it. And I heart her a lot for that. And I don't think that I'm projecting. I don't think that I'm reading too much into what she's saying in these chapters. Because, yes, these guys are vicious. And she frequently talks about that. And the way that they're disrespectful and leering, especially at Shauna, and really violent. But she also talks about the fact that, like, when they're in this encampment that is created for them, that the infighting and separating into groups to bully others is, like, an inevitable thing that's going to happen. And it remind there's a um, Onion article that says, uh, f like, 15 years in constant state of terror and violence fails to rehabilitate prisoner. And that's really, like, what I feel like she's doing here is she's trying to be like, yeah, are they bad people who deserve to be sent away from society? Probably. But also we put them in a position where they like are the worst version of themselves. And also we treat them like they are a, a like not, there is not an attitude in our country and you can disagree with this all you want, but the facts support this. There is not an attitude in our country that when people go to prison, we want them to be better people and return to society having learned something and being better. That is not the way that we handle it. And America has like more prisoners per capita in of any country in the world. Like our solution to fucking everything is to throw people in prison. And the fact that Chesney has this setup where it's just like, oh yeah, well we really, we have too many prisoners. We don't know what to do with them. So I guess, uh, tell them that they can get lands and, and money and stuff and send them over to this place for almost certain death. That feels a hundred percent like what would happen. Um, recently we had hurricane Michael. Was it? No, it was the one before that. Huh, so many hurricanes lately, um, where there were prisons flooding. 
flooding. And I, I don't mean like, you know, there was a foot of water on the ground flooding so that people were up to their chest in water for days and they were not being evacuated and nobody fucking cared. Nobody cared. It was disturbing to me because did like, did people commit crimes to be in prison? Allegedly. But if you are like me and you've started to like read more about how our system works, there's even a lot of gray area there. So there could be plenty of people who are in prison for nonviolent crimes or wrongfully convicted or set up. And even if they did commit a crime, do they deserve to just be abandoned in a cage for days and days, like in chest deep water until they starve to death or freeze to death or God knows what else? Y'all... The way that we deal with prisoners and the attitude towards them, the the comment sections under the articles about this prison that was failed to be evacuated were so upsetting, disturbing, and frankly, inhumane that that caused me like a lot of mental grief. That was that was an awakening for me to see how little anybody regards a person who has been in prison, that that fact that somebody was in jail, they are no longer a human being to a lot of people. And it's really fucking creepy to me how quickly we can th like flip that switch and how many people had no problem whatsoever with letting all of those folks die. They were fine with it. They basically, they had the same attitude to the storm as Mr. Chesney's people have to him having these guys come over and be killed Basically, oh, really? There was a storm and they weren't evacuated and they might all die? Well, that's cool. That'll make more room. That was really, truly the vast majority of comments that I saw. And I looked on multiple articles because after the first one that I checked, I was so upset by it that I looked in, on different news sites and at different comment sections on different Facebook posts looking for somebody to have some fucking compassion. And I swear to God, I could barely find any. It was like 5% of the posts were, hey, maybe we should give a shit about these people and try and help them. Otherwise, it was just, you know, this horrible, like, coldness of any folks who just were pretty much rooting for the dudes to die, really. It was like just short of that, you know? It was a poorly camouflaged eagerness for their deaths. So I feel like Wynne Jones here is, is, has really got some opinions and I feel like she's not giving these dudes a free pass. Like she frequently describes them as being incredibly violent and being just straight up vicious and unwilling to cooperate and whatnot. But there's an undertone to all of it. Like she, there's a, a section later about how being around means hearted people makes you that way as well. So I feel like there's a bit of a suggestion coming from her that maybe these guys did not always used to be like this and being in the environment that they were in turned them into someone that they didn't used to be, which I think a lot of people who have spent a long time in prison could probably tell you is exactly what happens. You have to become harder. You have to become less trusting. You have to become paranoid, really. Um, so anyway, I just felt like I wanted to talk about that because it feels like such a pointed reference to me that she's really trying to like, I, I, I didn't know how seriously to take it initially when this was dropped in our laps that these are who these soldiers are. But as she continues to reference their behavior and talk about the way how they behave is affecting everyone else, I feel more and more certain that this is her with a, a, like a little bit of commentary in this story. Um, and I think it's clever. I admire it. So, um, they start to push these guys over, over the, uh, countryside in order to get them to the next camp. Now, the problem is that these dudes, first of all, they're drugged. So they're not moving real fast. They don't, 
like have the understanding or coordination as a group as a real army would so they're just like they're not marching in step and like really like keeping up a pace they're just kind of shuffling along and they are ruining the countryside um and kit finally says well they're supposed to be laying the country waste they may as well start now um as the drive went on its pace slowed to a crawl Men in the midst of the crowd kept stumbling. When that happened, one of the riders would have to force their way among the shiny black bodies and haul the fallen man up before the others trod all over him. As Beauty would not go near the army and Barnabas had to lead the way, it was mostly Blade or Mara who had to do this. Blade was riding Nancy, Cob Nancy Cobber, who was the most obliging of all the horses, so he did most of it. He hated it. Probably Nancy did, too. The black armor smelled like tar, and the men themselves had a nasty smell of sweat and the drug and something Blade had never smelled before, which he suspected was the smell of prison, and he hated being surrounded by all their blankly staring faces. So, finally, these guys start to come out of their drug stupor, and it's much worse. At least before they had been sort of blank, now it's actively angry, resentful, hateful. And, I mean, they have to know that most of them are probably going to die out here, right? And they have to know that this is all at the behest of Chesney, right? They don't understand what this other world is, I suspect. So I'm going to guess that they blame everyone on this other world for being a part of this as well, instead of understanding that all of the folks that are hurting them along right now are as much beholden to Chesney as they are. Because I don't think I would get that. If I was one of them, I would assume that these people were somehow in charge or profiting off this or whatever. Mm. But really, that's not the case. None of these folks want to be involved in this at all. Um, so um, he saw one man pick up a loaf inside the dome because they have this huge dome um, that's like a, a magical um, shelter, basically, that they're using for the camp. Um he saw one man pick up a loaf inside the dome and have it instantly snatched off him by another. When the drug wore off, he knew there would be bullying, quarrels, and strong ones forming gangs to terrorize the rest. Shouldn't we take their swords away? he said. Barnabas shrugged. We don't usually bother. They have to be armed for the battles, after all. I don't suppose we'll lose many in camp fights. You reckon on twenty or so most years. They're criminals, Blade, Shona said, seeing how Blade was looking. Blade was not sure even criminals deserved this sort of thing, but he had no idea what to do instead. He felt miserable. He was still miserable when Barnabas said goodbye and vanished in a cheerful clap of thunder, horse and all. He found himself thinking of that camp most of the way home. And that's exactly it. You know what, Blade? I fucking feel you, man. We find out, like, in these chapters, Blade's really sensitive, honestly. He's got a lot of compassion and empathy to the point that it's hard for him to be around anybody going through any pain. Even when he goes and sees his father later, the the sight of the burns hurts him in a way. Um, but his his feeling of, like, I don't feel like this is right, but I don't know what to do instead. <sighs> Amen, brother. Seriously. It's like, we are so used to a certain system working a certain way that we have a complete failure of imagination when we try to imagine anything else. The whole idea of doing things differently is almost laughable because why would we when we've done it this way forever? If this is the system and it's been this way for this long, it must be the best system, right? Um, in which, <laughs> at this moment, I really urge all of you to read the book, Prisons Are Obsolete. So, enough about that. So, we have um, Mara, who is with them at this point, and she doesn't stay with them. She winds up like, does she stay with them? Actually, I'm realizing that when um, Blade goes home, she's not there. So, I guess she does stay. Um, doo -doo -doo. I got, oh no, because... Mara had arranged for the skeletal Fran Taylor to come up from the village and nurse Dirk. Okay, so we are back at the house here. Um, I've got the supper on, Fran said, since you were all so late, and there's been no change. I had to spend all day chasing these pigs away from him. I expect they're worried about him, Mara explained, which I love the fact that the pigs are like little bits of comfort. Um, at one point, what's her name, um, goes up into his room and like crouches down, the smallest one, and 
is surrounded by the pigs and just sits up there with her dad, like just waiting for him to wake up essentially. Um, let's see. Choo-choo-choo. And, um, Dirk still looked terrible. His breathing rattled as he slept. It was most discouraging. And Mum hasn't even been to look, Shona said. She's gone to look at the dragon instead. She was angry enough to ask, sweetly and dangerously over supper, And how is the poor dear dragon, Mother? Oh, I think he's going to be all right, Mara said, quite failing to notice Shona's sarcasm. He's just slept himself nearly dead, poor creature. So... I really want to know what's going on with Mara because I was very tempted to write off Dirk being concerned about his marriage simply because Dirk seems like the kind of person who's a worry wart and maybe (laughs) the kind of person (laughs) I'm going to make a little reference here. But those of you who have read the book, Rebecca, um, the main character has this habit and it's very I find it really entertaining to read, although it was a, a bit of a shock. The first time it happened, the main character has this um, tendency to to see a tiny gesture or expression on someone's face or misinterpret the words someone uses. And she will go off into this complete fabrication of what would probably happen or what is about to happen or what that person's thinking. So if somebody if she offers them dinner and they're they're like, oh, no, thanks, I'm not hungry. It turns into four paragraphs of she wondered if he wasn't hungry because he had heard that she was such a terrible cook. Probably he had gone into the kitchen and spoken to the cook and they laughed about the fact that she thought that she could make such and such and she was no good at making such and such. She bet that he had went out of his way before he even came to eat something so that he wouldn't have to put up with her terrible food. And and it goes on and on and on with something like this where she just like spins wildly out of control with just assuming and creating problems where there really aren't any. And that's not what the person meant at all. And I feel like that's who Dirk is, even though I don't have a lot of evidence for that yet. I don't know him that well, but I sort of get that vibe off him because of how he reacted to Mara, like saying that she was, uh, she had gotten some people to help and that, He doesn't know how they're going to pay for those people to help. So he like immediately leaps to the conclusion that Mara is like with another guy who's got money and she's going to use that to like he's basically assigns her an affair with a rich man whom she's going to use to pay this debt. And it's just the most elaborate, silly thing. Like, why would she do this? If that's the situation, there, there's no reason for her to keep it secret if she, if you're going to inevitably find out, which you would have to, if she produces this money from her, so like, just the whole thing. So, so because of how Dirk leapt to these bizarre conclusions, bizarre, at least to me, I assigned to him a personality trait of being somebody who does this frequently. And yet the fact that Mara hasn't been to see him really seems highly suspect. Like I don't, I can't come up with a a reasonable answer as to why not. Like, has she been really busy? Sure. She has, but also she's busy because she's helping her kids to cover for him. And wouldn't you want to like go and check up on his progress, RE healing just so that you could be sure that he's going to be back on his feet sometime soon. It's just, a, it, it's strange and I'm not sure maybe she feels like guilty because whatever's going on with this dragon, it seemed like she knew him before he came upon the house. So I wonder if there's not, and I might be wrong about that. It was just the familiar way in which she talked to the dragon um, that I'm wondering if she hasn't gone to see Dirk because she like feels bad because of her indirect involvement in this or what. Um So then we have a lot of talk about what dragons can do. And it's all this dragon lore that just sounds like nonsense. Dragons can will you into being dead. Did you know that? Or they can see into your mind and twist it, added Fran. It worries me that poor father may have looked it in the eye. If he did, then there's no knowing what might have what it might have done to him. Sometimes they can take up a wizard's own magic and use it against him, old George said. 
They do that by singing, you know, Fran put in. You didn't let this dragon sing to your father at all, did you? There wasn't much any of us could do to... There wasn't much any of us could stop it doing, Don said. None of this was in the dragon lore I learned at the university, Mara said firmly. So yeah, Fran and old George are just full of like a lot of old wives tales regarding dragons. And honestly, some of it's pretty fun and I kind of want it to be true just purely for, for the interest of it. Um, oh, it's Elda. That's right. That's the name of the Elda spent the night huddled on Dirk's bedroom carpet among the entire herd, anxiously listening to Dirk's, Dirk's difficult breathing while the owls sat in a row on Dirk's bedhead. I really like that because she gets so upset by the fact that they're talking about how powerful dragons are that it really makes it sound, at least to her, that they're saying, oh, well, he's dead. That's probably a, a lost cause at this point. Um, Blade had a miserable night, too, when he was not dreaming over and over of the dragon blasting smoke at Dirk. Uh, he was dreaming of being inside the magical camp full of men in shiny black. So this is really getting to Blade. And honestly, the fact that he's as focused on this as he is, is the sort of thing that would bother me a lot as a kid because I'd find it to be totally unrelatable. As a child, you have just a much more simplistic understanding of the world. So as a child, I would also have been like, well, whatever, they're prisoners, who cares? But as an adult, I'm much more like aware of how unjust and unfair and how prejudiced we are in this regard. And the fact that Blade can't seem to get past this, I find really admirable. I just, I'm impressed with him, to be honest, especially because he's somewhat young. So he has that sort of empathy, despite not having the experience of the world that a lot of us require in order to have that same sort of empathy. It's one thing as a kid to know that you don't like to see someone being bullied or you don't like to see animals being hurt or, you know, just anything specifically in pain. But it's another thing to to grasp nuanced issues like this and the fact that he can see, despite everyone around him really not seeming to see anything wrong, that he can see this isn't okay. That's a huge accomplishment. I mean... There is nothing that makes us believe we must be wrong more than being surrounded by people who disagree with us. It's, it's easy to fall prey to the, well, maybe I'm just overreacting kind of thing. When it's something that you haven't, you're not coming into the room with a fully formed opinion on. You're in the room as an issue is brought up and you have a feeling about it that's kind of spur of the moment that nobody else seems to also feel. That's a, that especially for a child, like is, a, is something that kids are not often strong enough to stand up to. And I don't feel like we should expect them to be, but Blade is really sort of proving himself to be somebody who's got his, I, his mind is more open and he just seems to consider more possibilities than anyone else is, or at least one could argue He's wasting his time thinking about more possibilities because as far as everyone else is concerned, I'm not sure that they don't see anything wrong with it. They could, and they're just deciding to back burner that shit because they don't have time to worry about justice on this point right now, which to be honest, I really understand. And that's something that it's, it's a dangerous sort of situation that I feel a lot of us find ourselves in. When our daily lives are like impacted by something that isn't really the right thing to do, but we tell ourselves, well, just this once I'm going to let it go because for the sake of expediency, I need to keep my job. I need to keep the peace with family. I need to do this and that. And it just sort of, uh, you can pretend that it's only this one time that I'm going to let something like this slide. And that's what allows shitty systems to continue because we don't ever have the energy and it never seems like the right time to make a big fuss about it. And while, you know, ideally that should not be how it works. I do understand that because being an adult, you got a lot to fucking take care of and think about. So maybe that's it because we don't spend a lot of time in anybody else's perspective, seeing how they feel about any of this. So for all I know, there's a couple others who agree with blade and they just don't really like make a fuss about it. 
Um, so Kit is figuring out a plan. I've been trying to work out what we ought to be doing, who needs to be where and when. We've got to reckon on Dad being laid up for at least two weeks and not too well for a month after that. It would be nice if we could have everything running smoothly for him when he's better, don't you agree? Yes, Shona said, looking soberly down at the map. I do. Everyone else sighed with relief. Confrontations between Kit and Shona could be terrible. Um, three pilgrim parties come through today three tomorrow, and three the next day, and so on for the next six weeks. They each have their first confrontations with the dark, uh, with the forces of dark five days later. Leathery winged avians, Alda said, checking the timetable with one careful talon. That's right, said Kit, and the wild hunt three days after that. They pick up their first clue a day later. Does anyone know where Dad planted the clues? So... It turns out Dirk has not finished planting the clues, and Colette is the one that starts to do that. Um, that's 1,260 clues in 30 different places, said Colette. I'll do it. Um, then I'll invent clues, said Shona. It seems like a proper bardic activity. What else is urgent, Kit? Most of it. We're going to be really busy, Kit said somberly. At three tours a day, by the end of three weeks, there are going to be 62 parties of off-worlders. 63, Don corrected him. Sixty-three, then, said Kit, spread out over most of the continent, all needing to have adventures with the Dark Lord, or at least once a week. Um, and a week after that, some of them might even be coming up for their final encounters. And I like that these are capitalized. Final encounters. We might find ourselves having to provide a Dark Lord for the first ones to kill, depending on how Dad is. But the two most urgent things to work out are, how are we going to provide all the right adventures on time? How do we get Dirk home converted into a citadel? There's no way Dad's going to be fit enough to transform the house. Um, can't Barnabas do the house? Blade asked. Yes, if you want him to know Dad can't, Shona said crushingly. Kit, Mum can change the house. She's been loving converting Aunt's house. We should have asked her before she went back there. But Kit points out that Mara is really busy and probably won't be able to schedule time to come home and do that and then go back again. Um, so there, this goes on like they're they're planning on this and they all have their different jobs. I'm not going to get too into too much detail on that, but. Uh, I like the fact that Kit is like so irritated the whole time and everybody gets mad like or he gets mad at everybody's suggestions. But then a lot of the time it turns out that those suggestions actually have merit. Um, so if we take the army and the animals and keep going north from here, we'll be able to devastate the country and cut across the path of the tours to do their adventures from wherever we happen to be. Um, so. We go off into chapter 10. Five days later, everyone was wishing that the dragon had never been born, or that it had fallen out of the sky on its way to Darkholm, or that there had been some other way to help Dirk. Um, yeah, this is really bad. The soldiers are, first of all, super uncooperative. They're eating everything, but they wind up, like, not camping in the places that they were supposed to camp because the rate of travel isn't what it had been expected to be. Um, let's see. They, Barnabas had set up camps for soldiers, what he considered a day's march apart. Blade and Don were still wondering how anyone made men, even men who wanted to, walk that fast. They had been many miles short of the camp the first night anyway, because of setting off late in the morning after Kit's council, and had to park the horde of soldiers in a bare field near a large village. But the villagers were not helpful. They barricaded themselves into their houses and refused to let Blade have more than one cartload of bread, and they demanded cash for it. Luckily, Shona had brought every scrap of money she could find in the house. The villagers took all of it, on the fairly reasonable grounds, that the soldiers had trampled over their fields and claimed that Blade and Shona owed them for the bread. It took all Shona's bardic powers of persuasion to make them let Blade enter the debt on his machine with buttons. So... Yeah, they like there were supposed to be camps and, and provisions and whatnot set up for them, but they aren't, can't even access them because they aren't they aren't reaching the points that they're supposed to be, which, you know, as somebody who understands what it's like to have part of your plan not work out and have everything sort of hinge 
on ev- all of the parts of your plan occurring when they're supposed to, I deeply understand that feeling of panic of like, we're not there yet. We're supposed to be there. We can't like make up the time that we missed today, tomorrow by having them march for 20 hours. So the fact that we fell behind today means that we're just going to continue to fall more and more behind because we are realizing now that the pace we originally established is impossible. So that's a really terrible, shitty feeling. And I, I felt it in my soul. I really did. Like they're being upset about this. It, it's just, you know, there's, there's nothing quite like knowing there's nothing you can do to, to catch up. And I feel like I live in that state of that feeling of, of deep, deep uh, worry and anxiety and sadness that I know I will never be like at even with the amount of work that I've got. Um, that first morning, it was clear that nearly a quarter of the men were gone. A quarter. Guys, here goes something that never even occurred to me would happen. Of course it would happen. But for some reason, I believed that there was some kind of like restriction on them, either via magic or via like, you know, you're not going to get your reward. But like, they must know that they're not meant to survive this. So why would you stick around? You just try and make your fortune somewhere in this world. Like, it's not so alien that they can't survive out on their own. It's basically like... You know, it feels like the descriptions of the land is very much like England or maybe somewhere slightly warmer. Maybe if you're getting towards like Spain, Italy. Um, So there is no reason why these guys would stick around. But that never entered my mind as a possibility. And that's really troublesome because they're supposed to be like 6,000, right? So a quarter disappeared? You've got like a thousand men minimum rampant in this country doing God knows what. Um, So the soldiers were even more horrible than Blade had thought. They were inventively, jeeringly, mutinously, murderously horrible. It was probably only because of the drugs uh, taking time to wear off that Blade, Shona, and the two Griffins got them as far as the next camp on the second day. They did not want to walk. They made this plane on the third day by all willingly leaving the camp and then just sitting down in the mud outside. Some of the soldiers now had quite severe scratches and gashes where Kit and Don had flown at them and pecked them to make them move. Those with the scratches, as far as Blade could see, boasted about them for the next two days. Pecking had not shifted one of them. Kit, in his exasperation, remembered the campfires and deciding this was one thing he might be good at, flew down and enveloped the sitting men in an illusion of fire. It looked a bit pale and ghostly, but it got most of the men on their feet. It did not get them moving. It ain't real, they called out and started to sit down again. It was only when Shona, in sheer fury, turned the carnivorous sheep among them that they moved. They ran, some of them with charming little white sheep attached to their legs or backsides, and the rest shouting about monsters. These sheep, you guys. I know we've see- we've read that they were carnivorous. One of them is eating a pigeon. I didn't know it was like this, though. They ate everything meaty, rabbits, mice, voles, birds, and would not walk while they were eating. They had to be carefully penned up at night where they tried to eat the dogs. In the end, Shona drove them along in the same kind of magical reins that Kitten Blade had to invent for the soldiers. The reins were long pieces of thread unraveled from Shona's bardic robes, and they were Shona's own idea. The magic was mostly Kit's, though Blade had helped. By that third day, Shona hated the soldiers even more than Blade or Don did. They called remarks at Shona all the time. Some of the remarks could have been flattering, but even those were remarks about what Shona was like under her clothes and what ought to be done with her. The other suggestions were horrible. Luckily, Shona was riding Beauty, and Beauty still refused to go within more than a hundred yards of the soldiers, so Shona was spared hearing most of the remarks clearly, but she heard enough. 
So, yeah. This is another thing about Wynne Jones's writing that, you know, would this come up if C.S. Lewis were talking about unruly men? No. This is not something that would even occur to him to write about, I'm sure. Or if it did, it wouldn't be in the, like, sincere way. It would just be like, oh, I want to point out how how mean this one particular guy is and that he does this. But I love that when Jones is like, oh, no, all of them, all of them as a group, like some might be worse than others, but they all do it and they're all a threat. Yeah, that feels right. That feels true. <laughs> um, so she does the reins. Um, the, the soldiers had no choice but to walk into the reins as they left it. And if Don or Kit flew ahead and Don or Kit flew ahead dragging. Even so, that fourth day, the soldiers contrived to set fire to a field of grain, a hillside, and a wood they passed through. No one knew how. Who cares, said Kit. They're supposed to be ravaging the place. Blade looked back regretfully at fine, slender, living trees curling and cracking in the rolls of smoke, and he felt for that wood. He could feel the trees hurting. That surprised him because he had not realized that his magic was that much like Dirk's. So, first of all, Blade does not call his father dad, but maybe this isn't from his POV, so maybe that's part of it. But um, the fact that he can feel the trees hurting and that that's part of his father's magic, I find really interesting because I don't think that we know that yet. Um, and that is like pointing to another kind of empathy, reminding me of Parable of the Sower and the fact that she has hyper empathy, where if anybody gets hurt. She feels it as if it's happening to her. Um, that feels like something that Blade is going to have to get a handle on because that leaves you really vulnerable. So, yeah, I feel really bad for this kid in some ways, to be honest. Um, Big Hen uh, seems to disappear, but then comes back Um so they are like, they're just getting into a bunch of trouble with all of the animals. There is, um, a dog. This is so awful. They were delayed by having to bury one of the dogs and tow the corpse of a friendly cow behind two of the horses. The soldiers had killed them both for being too friendly. Briny, the dog had simply gone up to one of the soldiers on the outside of the mob, wagging his tail and trying to get acquainted. That soldier had calmly drawn his sword and cut Briny's head off. One of the cows had followed Briny to see what was going on and run into a wall of slashing swords. Blade was nearly in tears. The, like, honestly, that's so horrifying. Like, just, the, it, it wasn't a dog, like, doing anything to them. It wasn't a dog hassling them or trying to steal their food or anything like that. It just walked up to them. Um... And then you find out that the dogs know exactly, the rest of them know exactly what happened to Briny, and they were planning to tear out the throats of the rest of the soldiers. Blade had to keep them leashed on more bespelled threads from Shona's robes. Yikes! Um, yeah, just, I, I want these dogs, don't get me wrong, I kind of want that, but, um, they made you mean, these soldiers. That was the trouble. By the fourth day, when the soldiers still chanted that they wanted roast beef, mixed in with whistles and jeers whenever they saw Shona, Blade realized that being alongside so many nasty people had a bad effect on you. Don, he discovered, felt the same. I don't know what does it, Don confided to him, but they make me feel weak and depressed and vicious all the same time. I don't know how Kit stands it. They really hate him. So Kit, it turns out, is the one that they really view with ferocious, unspoken hatred. Blade could feel it like acid on his skin whenever he and Kit chanced to be near the soldiers together. Can't you feel it? Kit answered with an open-beaked gurgle of laughter. Perfectly well. I rather like making people afraid of me. It's a bit more than that, Blade said anxiously. So, Pretty disappears, and they don't know what's going on with Pretty. But then, all of a sudden, surprise, he's back, and he's with six men in a green haze. 
And it turns out that these are elves who uh, are just as sort of high and mighty and in fucking sufferable to deal with as elves in many things. And it delights me so much that they are like portrayed in this way. Um, but it turns out that the eldest son of the elf king, who would be Tal Talithan. Talion is the elf king. Talithan is his son. Um, that he made a prophecy that his father found offensive um, and that he is being punished by being forced to go serve the Dark Lord as a master for a year and a day. So they're basically like, well, you know, he's not with us because he fell ill and yada, 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 but he's at home if you want to go see him. Um, and in the, within this conversation, he asks Kit, forgive me if I ask impertinently, but how do two members of your race call the Dark Lord father? Because he is, Kit said, rather astonished. He bred us from eggs. Talithan smiled. That explains my puzzle. I had not thought there were any griffins this side of the ocean. But if you were fetched over in the egg, the reason is clear. He bowed to the astonished Kit, to Don, to Blade, and the still staring Shona. Farewell. I must no longer interrupt your herding of this unpleasant soldiery. Um, and then we, like later on, they, um, I'm forgetting who's talking about it, but they are pretty sure that this revelation means that at some point Kit is going to leave because he wants to find others of their kind across the ocean. And even though he couldn't make it flying, he would be able to take a boat and find out about more of them. So that kind of worries the others. Although, you know, obviously that's in the distant future here. Um, and Shona says that she had a dream about the prince, but it wasn't a nice dream. She said there were dwarves in it too, and you'd been drowned, and there was something wrong with Dad. I just couldn't believe it when he turned out to be real. I, um, it was a scary dream. Kit prowled swiftly back to the soldiers and commenced shaking the magic reins to get the procession moving again, obviously in a very bad temper indeed. Blade thought he knew how Kit felt. Elves, when they went away, had the effect of leaving you feeling flat and ordinary and ugly. Everything seemed unpleasant. Um, so yeah, that is, I feel like that, have you guys ever been around somebody like really beautiful, someone really just so stunning and vibrant that when they're gone, it's like light goes out of the room. It's there's, a, you know, precious few people in the world that have that feel to them. But yeah, definitely one of them. Um, so let's see do, 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 what happens next. Oh, right. Um, the rain starts to come down and the soldiers warm inside their camp jeered and shouted and sang half the night while their four supervisors shivered. At dawn, the frost melted and the rain began. The soldiers sat down inside the transparent walls of the camp, snug and dry, and refused to come out. This was when Blade began truly wishing the dragon had died before it got to Dirk home. So, I don't understand why they can't just dismantle this camp. Like, you know, it's obviously it's a magical dome, but Kit and blade have magic barnabas was with them for a time but i guess he left can't they disrupt it so that the soldiers all get rained on and they're sort of forced to move um but yeah just so blade decides that he's going to translocate home but he doesn't go into detail about what he's trying to do here um he says let's see there's no way we're going to get there by then, even if they came out now. I don't think they'll move until they've eaten all the food in there. But we can't get to half the places in time from here, Kit snarled. We can get to the first lots, Blade said. They all have avians up in the coastal hills, and I can translocate there easily. Just close the camp up again. I have a sort of idea about something I can do. It may work. It may not work, but I'll tell you if it does. Just shut the camp up while I'm away. Um... 
so Blade, uh, he leaves and he had intended to, you know, go to this destination, but he winds up at home. Um, the first time he winds up outside of the, uh, the house and he sees the elves and is immediately like, Hmm. Okay. You know what? I don't need to see them right now. Um, and then he goes inside and sees his family and tells them about the elves, warns them because they showed up and like Alita's already cooking for them, but he's trying to explain what they want. Um, how's dad? I don't know. Leda squawked distressfully. I can't tell anymore. You go and look and see if you think he looks any different and tell Elda she's got to let Fran put ointment on his burns this time because I can't. So he goes upstairs and Elda and Fran are just really like going at each other a little better, a little bit. Um, they are not happy. Like Fran, I think resents that Elda is not a human and is trying to take responsibility for this. And Elda resents that Fran is not family and is like kind of overstepping her boundaries is, is the impression that I get. Um, and, but when he sees his father, he's really excited to see how much better his dad looks than he did. It's just like, he's just healing really fast, which I wondered about, but it turns out that there is a reason for that, which we find out later. Um, so blade goes to see the dragon this is the second time we see the dragon uh, or the first time that we see the dragon in this section. And we wind up seeing him one more time later. Um, the dragon looks much better, has started healing. Blade finally says to him, listen, I'm not going to sit here and like lecture you about why you shouldn't have done that. But the fact is you owe us now. And by hurting him, you set him way behind and, and, we're having to do his work for him now. And there are like 600 murderers. Oh, 600. I thought there were 6,000. Oh, this is so much less than I thought. Never mind. Um, pretending to be soldiers out in the middle of nowhere down the waste. And we're supposed to be moving them to a base camp, but they won't move. Leave them there then, said the dragon. We can't. And there's a bunch of like arguing and it turns out the dragon's kind of fucking with him. Um, Someday I must meet this Mr. Chesney of yours. I ought to pay my respects to the one who rules the dragons of this world, ought I not? Very well, then. I shall come and pay my debt to your father tomorrow at dawn. So he agrees to this, which I wasn't sure how he'd be. I just had not quite gotten a sense of the dragon yet. But I do like this. Um, and then we have Dirk waking up, which... Again, I just didn't expect this to happen so quickly. Like, he's still not in good shape. Don't get me wrong. He could barely walk. He has to enchant himself in order to get his legs to work the way they're supposed to. But overall, yeah, he's doing way better than anybody expected. Um, and he's really bummed when he finds out that Mara is not the one that has been looking after him while he's sick. The thing that wakes him up, as it turns out, is that he is being summoned by somebody via magic and he felt it so deeply that it wound up waking him up out of a fucking magical coma excuse me so it never even entered my head that the dragon was the one doing this but it turns out that he is and he doesn't even recognize the dragon once he sees him again because he's so much better looking than he had been that he looks like a totally different animal. Um, I, and if I had not specifically called you, I would not have known you either. The dragon rumbled. My apologies. I asked you here to make amends. And I like that he, he says, I keep forgetting f how fragile humans are. Like he really wasn't ready to see how bad Dirk looked. Um, once your wife had explained the situation to me, I saw that I had acted hastily and stupidly. I should never have burned you. Um, I was angry and shamed. I had been asleep. Possibly I had settled down to die when I was suddenly woken to find the world a different place. Dragons I had known as infants were now not only full grown, but of all things, kowtowing to humans, taking part in a ridiculous game. And when I asked them their reasons, all they could do was stare into the distance and pretend to be immeasurably wise. Yes, they do that. The modern dragons, Dirk said. I thought it was the dragon way. 
I don't hold with it, said the green dragon. No living creature has the right to claim wisdom. There's always more to find out. I should know that. I imagine you know it too, wizard. I've never felt wise, Dirk said frankly. But I suppose it is a temptation to stare into distance and make people think you are. It's humbug, said the dragon. It's also stupid. It stops you learning more. I went away from the adults and asked the fledgling dragons. There are only two of them. That's bad. Dragon numbers are badly down. They say adults are too busy with those pilgrim parties to breed. So I asked about the pilgrim parties, and they told me that a Mr. Chesney is responsible for them, and the dragons side with Mr. Chesney because he is the chief evil in the world. Foolishness. Dragons are never on anyone's side. And they told me also that the Dark Lord represents Mr. Chesney in our world. I was very angry and very shamed for my people, and I came here directly, intending, I am afraid, to kill the Dark Lord. You were lucky that I was tired and feeble and had no real fire. Um, and he doesn't know exactly what it was that woke him up, but it was something like blue lightning, which Dirk realizes is probably the demon that he summoned. So somehow the demon woke this dragon up. Um, and also, the fucking dragon can read minds. Hi. That was a little detail that I guess uh, Blade did not pick up on. But Dirk does. Um, I'm quite excited to know you read minds. There aren't many who can these days. Nobody bothers to practice, that's all, said the dragon. It used to be one of the first things they made you do when you started to learn magic. You could do it, wizard, if you'd been properly taught. And be thankful that I was properly taught. I've been lying here learning things about you and about your household that I wouldn't otherwise known. If I hadn't, I might have killed most of your little cat birds. Certainly the brown one. She was the most insulting. But the other two were quite rude, too. I love that he calls them cat birds. I love it. Um, so, and, and, but despite them being insulting, the dragon's like, but they were really worried about you and they were mad at me. So what are you going to do? Um, it was partly on Blade's account that I called you here. It seemed that he and three others are engaged in marching 600 murderers ac across the country. What a mess, Dirk groaned again. Apart from the danger, there sh should surely have been more than 600 soldiers. Barnabas had said there were to be a thousand. Yes, I'd better see about that once. Um, see about that at once. So... At this point, Dirk is like trying to get to his feet because he realizes that he just has so much to do and he's going to hurry away. And the dragon stops him and is like, listen, how about you give me the authority to go and intimidate the hell out of them and get them to move along? And Dirk's like, yeah, you know what? OK. Um, meanwhile, I should perhaps tell you that you have six members of the elder race, as they wrongly call themselves. Dragons are much older waiting in your house upon some footling errand of honor, which they regard as hugely important. So the dragon agrees that he's going to go off and do this and leave. And uh, he is just so humongous. I would love to see this on screen and see exactly how big he is. Um, and then Dirk goes home and the elves, this is such a weird scene. First of all, Dirk is greeted by the elves um, in his dining room and all of his flying pigs come in to greet him for being well again. They're very excited and they've been worried about him. And the elves start laughing hysterically. And Prince Talithan tells him, my brother long ago went adventuring to our neighbor world where Mr. Chesney has him prisoner, thus forcing all elves to do his will. And when my father lately was sorrowing at this and saying that surely one day my brother must escape and come home to us, I answered him bitterly and scoffingly, saying, yea, that day will come when pigs do fly, for which reason my father grew angry and sent me to you to become the Dark Lord's minion. And here, where I come, behold, pigs fly. And it turns out that he is willing to exchange a year of service for pretty, which Dirk is really loath to do because he likes pretty and wanted to breed him. And Telethan basically is like, listen, we can still breed him. We will treat pretty amazing, but I got to have one. And if we can breed him and have enough for everybody else, then okay, fine. But I'll have the best one. And I'll have the first one and it'll be amazing. And, 
Uh, I will most faithfully serve you, Lord, if only you will let me have pretty at the end of that time. Um, pretty can be a dreadful handful. He is a cult of infinite spirit, Talithan said. But this was one way of ensuring that Kirita could not get her hands on pretty. Pretty would be far happier being doted on by an elf prince than shut up in a pen at the university. Oh, all right. After a year and a day, then, your highness. Witnessed, chorused the five captains. My liege, command me as you will. Um, finally, he tells him, Tour number two has an expendable whom one of you has to kill in a surprise attack tomorrow, and after that you'd better look at the ten cities you'll be besieging. So they bail uh, to take care of that. And he winds up heading up to bed and I lo like he's being force fed broth. Like, you know, it's really, he's not doing well. Like he's done quite a lot more today than he probably should have in his condition. Um, so he winds up getting things a little bit more organized. He says, Elda, you'll find the right number of clues in a package in the top right hand corner of my desk, yellow envelope. So they're already done. Colette, he actually tells her she shouldn't be the one doing the flying because it turns out that Lita, this, okay, I'm going to tell you guys, this actually got me a little bit misty eyed. Um, she, Lita is fat and slower, but Dirk says, uh, however tired and cross you are, she'd never call a dragon names. <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, let's see. Oh, here it is. Um, I'll get on with the clues. Not now. You need to rest. Let L Lida do it. Me? Lida sprang angrily across the room. I can't fly worth nuts. She has to launch from the window, Colette squawked. L uh, Lida can certainly do it. She's a long-distance flyer. I should know. I made you that way, Lida. If you go slow and take it steady and work up gradually to longer distances, you'll be doing a hundred miles without noticing after a week. Are you sure? said Lyda. I thought you were making fun of me. Of course I'm sure, said Dirk. I built you with a double-sized heart, massive wing muscles, slow metabolism. You've got better circulation than Colette has. You were a special model. I hoped you might manage to cross the ocean when you were full grown. But I wasn't going to bother you with that idea until you were older. Lyda's beak bent, and she looked uncertainly at her bulging front. I'm fat. Most of it's muscle, said Dirk, though some is due to overeating, I'll admit. You'll have to work the fat off as you fly. And make sure you have a high place to launch from until your muscles adjust, won't you? I loved this so much that it's like, oh, Lida, yeah, you're fat. But also, like, you were purposely made that way because it's super useful in a very specific way. And I just didn't get into that yet because you're young. But it's very valuable and worth its own respect. Which, as somebody who is not of a certain body type... I really beat myself up for not having the body of like one of the track team members in my school. When looking back, I had a really athletic body, but it was like muscle. Like I, I was a bit of a powerhouse versus somebody who was lanky and like could run really fast. I was strong and I did not value that at all because I had only one very narrow idea of what an athlete looks like. And I can't express enough how delighted I am at people like Serena Williams, who is of similar body type to mine. And I'm not saying that I look like Serena. I'm saying that if I worked out in that way, my body would be very heavily muscled versus like losing weight. I would look more like her than I would like a Victoria's Secret model. Um, it's nice to see that kind of body being represented a little bit more because it's obviously super powerful it's just a very different type of body with the different pros and cons to it. And it's, it was a tough time to grow up thinking that there was only one body that really had any type of worth. So this just got me kind of misty eyed, you know, just like, Oh, you know, he's telling her like, yeah, you're different. And that's a good thing. We need you. Um, and Colette being left to not do that job that she was like really invested in anymore is kind of upset, but Dirk enlists her to design the changes to the house to turn it into a citadel. And it's just really like kind of a sweet moment. Like Dirk realizes that Colette's hurt and comes up with a job that she would be really good at, that she would also like. And I just, I really like the fact that 
he is so good at managing everybody and sensing what their strengths and weaknesses are and working with that. He's just he's a, a much better leader than I think I knew. So I feel like I've learned something about him in these chapters. Um, so, yeah, that's the end of that chapter. That was chapter 11. So that is the end of the episode. I kind of had to rush the end there because I spent so much time talking about the prison system. I'm sorry. Um, but this was really fun. I'm really enjoying this book and it's just so weird. It's so weird. I love Diana Wynne Jones. She's a fucking weirdo. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to Patricia again for commissioning this episode. And I hope that all of you guys are enjoying listening. If you are, don't forget to pick up the book if you can. And, um, I will see you soon. I think with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.